317. Hymn 317. Christ our Redeemer died on the cross when I see the blood. Hymn 317. Let's stand please to sing. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for that blood which was shed for us. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to know you as our personal Savior, if we will but trust in you. We pray, Father, that tonight we would hear your word, that we would learn from it, that we would change our lives according to how you would direct in our hearts and our lives, that, Father, once again, we would strive for Christ-likeness that we would love you, and that we would model ourselves after you. Give us a great evening. Be with our pastor. Again, give him the words to say. For it's your precious name we ask it. Amen. Hymn 119. Hymn 119. One of my favorites. I have too many favorites, but one of my favorites. Great is thy faithfulness.
get to that chorus, we'll ask the instruments to drop out, singing on the last. Pardon for sin and the peace of Folks, you may be seated. All right, good evening, everybody. Take your Bibles with me and turn to the book of Ecclesiastes tonight, Ecclesiastes chapter 10. That's Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes chapter number 10. Uh, I've been preaching, just started back in Kings, and you're like, why are you taking a break from Kings already? I'll tell you the truth. I misplaced one of the commentaries that I rely on as I was studying it and couldn't find it. And uh, so I didn't want to pay the $30 to, to replace that book, which I know that I'll find. So I'll be back to Kings next week. We had a little trip this week to St. Louis um, for the girls. Uh, they had to uh, go to Shriners down there and get, um, they're going to be getting braces for their backs, uh, and so had to go down there and get fitted for those, and, um, and so we're going to be in Ecclesiastes. This is just a book that this last week I've been reading in my devotions, and Ecclesiastes is probably one of my favorite books. It was written by Solomon, um, probably near the end of his life. Solomon lived about as rich and accomplished a life as a person ever did. Uh, God gave him um, immense wisdom, more than any person besides the Lord Jesus Christ that ever lived. His human wisdom was just amazing, right? Um, he had power. He, he presided over Israel at the zenith of Israel's power. So Israel was as close to a superpower underneath King Solomon as it ever would uh, be. He had immense wealth. So much so that other, uh, other kings and queens traveled to see the wealth that he had. Uh, he had, uh, was it, 300 wives and 700 concubines. So romance was not a problem, apparently, for King Solomon. Um, well, maybe it was a problem. I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, he, he had literally accomplishments the boggle of the mind, I mean, he, he did uh, in his day some things that would be like the wonders of the world. Uh, he was like an architect. He just brilliant, brilliant man, as accomplished as anybody who ever lived. Um, and near the end of his life, he wrote this book about the meaning of life. And uh, I think it's one of the greatest books of wisdom uh, that's ever written. And of course, it's scripture. Um, and it's a little bit hard to to get through sometimes because it deals with some of the dark truths and kind of looks at them as a, from the perspective without God sometimes. Um, but there's a lot of great truth to be found in the book of Ecclesiastes. When you get to the end, though, uh, the last couple chapters kind of almost revert to like Proverbs. And he's just giving different lessons for life. And so chapter 10 is one of those chapters. And uh, we're going to just read through the chapter and I, I, I think there's a, there's a dozen, an even dozen, uh, life lessons in Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Now, when I was in college and I was, they were teaching us how to preach, they said, 
good sermons are like an arrow. They have one point. Well, this sermon is like buckshot or birdshot. <laughs> it's kind of like there's 12 points tonight. So uh, maybe, it, maybe one will hit you. Maybe it won't. I don't know. Um, but we're going to look at the 12 lessons here in Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll just dive right into the word. All right. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll help us as we look at these passages of scripture. Help us to examine our hearts and uh, ask ourselves, Lord, if uh, any of these things apply to us and if there's areas that we need to work on. Um, Lord, I know that there are several things in here that I need to work on. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help me as, uh, as I seek to do those things and implement these things in my life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 1. Look at it with me. It says, Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth the little folly, him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. What does that mean? Okay, the first lesson I think Solomon makes here is that little vices matter. Little vices matter. Okay? Ointment of the apothecary. What's that? Just another name for perfume. That's what it's saying. And it's something that would ordinarily smell very good, right? Perfume. Um, but if a few little flies get into the ointment before it's sealed and die in there, then you're not going to get something that's good when you open that perfume bottle. You're going to get something that stinks. Okay? And so the idea here is just something little like a fly, just something little that, that you ordinarily wouldn't even notice, uh, just a little foolishness, a little bad habit can spoil the reputation of somebody who otherwise would seem very wise and very accomplished and very godly. And so what I think Solomon's saying in this verse is that little things matter. You know, the temptation of all of us is to look at our sins and our vices, our bad habits, and say, oh, you know, it's just a little bad temper. You know, it's just a little laziness, just a little grumpiness. Maybe it's just a little drinking. I'm not a drunk, you know, just a little bit, just a little gambling. Um, just buy a scratch ticket every now and then. It's not a big deal. Just a little foul humor. But those things can spoil your reputa reputation and hinder your ability to serve the Lord. Um, let me ask you this, okay? Um, what would you think? By the way, I probably shouldn't use this because the neighborhood has, never mind, I'll, you'll, you'll see in a second, but what would you think if just once a month or so, I drove down to, to Rise in Charleston and uh, I got some marijuana and smoked it in my backyard, you know, just a little thing, totally legal, right? We're in Illinois, it's completely legal now, just a little habit, not hurting anybody. Um, by the way, if you smell that, it's not me. The reason why I said that, my next door neighbor has developed a weed smoking <laughs> habit, and so sometimes uh, you might come into the, the, the church and smell something a little funky. I promise you that it's not me. I never touch that stuff, never will. All right? But if I did, if I did, that would ruin my reputation, right? You would think much less of me if you knew that I liked the wacky tobacco in my weekends. All right? Um, so be on the lookout. The idea here is be on the lookout for bad habits little vices because they can spoil your testimony and kill them while they're small um, before they make your whole life stink. Okay, that's the first lesson. Look at the next verse, verse 2. It says, A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. I think the second lesson here is that we are to keep your heart under control. Keep your heart under control. Um, in the Bible, the idea of having something at your right hand, okay, is to, to, it means to keep it close, keep it under control, uh, keep, a, keep a watch on it. So what it's saying is that if you're wise, you're going to keep close tabs on your heart, on, um, on your mind, on your, on your inner life. You're going to keep that under control. You're going to keep an eye on it. But if you're foolish, you're just going to let that go. It's going to be on your left hand. Um, 
And I think this is a reminder that most of our sins, they don't start out as terrible actions. Um, they start out as little seeds that we let grow in our mind, right? That we let grow in our heart. You know, a, a man just doesn't, one of my, my least favorite expressions, sometimes you'll hear someone say, oh, well, you know, that, that brother, he just fell into idolatry or fell into adultery, okay? People don't fall into adultery, right? You, you have to let those, there, there are seeds that you have to let, you know, grow in your brain and grow in your heart for a long time before you go out and actually commit those sins. And so what it's saying is to keep a close guard on your heart. Don't let bitterness or greed or lust or uh, dissatisfaction take root there. Keep your heart at your right hand. Okay, third lesson. Keep your mouth under control. Look at verse 3. It says, uh, Yea, also, when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him, and he saith to everyone that he's a fool. I love that. Imagine somebody walking around and is like, Hey, hey, Dwight, I'm a fool. Hey, Trent, I'm a fool, right? Hey, you over there, I'm a fool, I'm crazy, stay away from me. That's the idea, okay? I think, I'm sure a million people have said this, but I know Ronald Reagan said it. Um, he said, I'd rather keep silent and be thought a fool than to open my mouth and remove all doubt. That's the same idea here. I'll tell you a story. When I was about Noah's age, Noah, was I, I was about your age, um, my, my family, my extended family, used to take this annual pilgrimage, this road trip from Massachusetts up through Canada to the upper peninsula, peninsula of Michigan. My grandfather grew up in a town called um, Gladstone in the UP. Uh, we called it Happy Rock, Gladstone, Happy Rock. You'll figure that out later. Okay, um, and uh, we, we used to take a trip up there with our family regularly, like every year, every year or two. And one year, my parents couldn't make it, um, but for some reason, they let me, who was like 10 years old, go with my uncle and my cousins. So all the uncles and cousins and all, we all traveled through Canada to, to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and it was just me, okay? And the one thing I remember about that trip is this. I remember just talking everybody's ears off the entire time. I was just a total motor mouth the entire time. Just would not stop talking. And like the chorus, by the time the trip was over, every single one of my uncles had said this thousands of times, Ryan, shut up, right? Like they just would be quiet. I just talked everybody's ears off. Um, wise people, wise people know when to keep their mouth shut. Um, and fools don't. I was a fool. Fools walk around telling everyone they're fools because they can't keep their mouth shut. So that's the, the next lesson. Keep, the, keep your mouth under control. Look at uh, number four. Okay, four of twelve. Uh, verse four. It says, If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place, for yielding pacifieth great offenses. Here's what I think Solomon was saying in this verse. I think he was saying, don't jump around whenever there's adversity, especially when you're under authority, okay? If you have a boss or you're under authority at church or what, whatever situation, okay, and you mess up and someone has to get on to you, um, maybe somebody points out some flaw that you have. How many of you understand that there are people, it's very easy to be this kind of person, there are people that whenever they're corrected, move on, right? Um, there are times where I probably should say something to some people in church, and in the back of my mind I think, if I point that out to that person, they'll probably just go leave and find another church. They'll just move on. There are people, uh, depending on how the job market is, right, there are people, if their boss gets on to something, to, about something, they'll just go find another place to work. The easiest thing in the world. And they just go through life whenever there's a problem, running away. 
There are a lot of pastors this way, by the way. There are a lot of pastors that, have, you know, maybe they've been pastoring for 30 years, but they've really only pastored for two years 15 times. Because as soon as there's a problem, they just run away. All right? Don't be the person that runs whenever there's adversity. Um, learn from that decision. Learn from that thing. And the lesson that God has from you, the wise way to live is to say, you know, I need to, I need to work on that and own your mistake and try to do better. And uh, don't try to run away from that kind of trouble. Stick out, stick it out, and do better. Okay? Um, number five. This is a good lesson for you young people. Life is not fair. Life is not fair. Look at verses 5 to 7 here. It says, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, as an error which proceedeth from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in the low place. I have seen servants upon horses, and princes walking as servants upon the earth. All right? What is, what is Solomon saying? He's saying, you know what? You know what stinks in life? Sometimes bad people get ahead. Sometimes people who are less qualified than you, with less character than you, or people who are dumber than you, whatever, sometimes they will get ahead. Sometimes they will be, be promoted ahead of you. Um, in a perfect world, in, in pure meritocracy, the cream would always rise to the top. But in the real world, the world that we live in, it doesn't work that way. All right? Maybe that, as a general principle it works that way. But, you know, there are times where crooked things happen and people get a jump up, a leg up. It's not fair. It's never going to be fair until Jesus comes back. Okay? Maybe you're, you know, maybe you're in school and the coach's kid gets to start even though he's terrible. Right? Okay? Or the mayor's kid gets to start, even though he's terrible. Right? You know, that's not fair. That's not how it should be, but that's how it is. Okay? Uh, you know, maybe a, you know, the boss's kid at work gets to sit and make lots of money and have some dumb title that doesn't mean anything and sit in the corner and play video games all the time. Okay? Uh, you know, maybe there's a guy in your office that that comes in late and leaves early and doesn't really do anything, and he gets promoted over you, and it's not fair. Life's not fair, okay? You have to expect that and be at peace with that. It's part of the fallen world that we live in. All right, next. next. By the way, it stinks. It's okay. Solomon said it's a sore evil, so it's okay to say it's a sore evil too. It's just You're, you're not going to make it go away. All right, verses 8 and 9. Next lesson. It says, uh, he that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh the hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Whoso removeth stones shall be hurt therewith, and he that cleaveth wood shall be in danger thereby. Okay? What's this lesson? I think lesson number six here that Solomon was saying is if you go around making trouble, that trouble will find you eventually. If you go around making trouble, eventually that trouble will get to you. Because, I mean, if you mess with people, <laughs> if you make mischief, right, you are setting up a trap that you're going to step in yourself someday. And uh, so a wise person stays away from that as much as they possibly can. They don't make mischief. They don't make trouble. They mind their own business. I have one child. <laughs> I'm not going to say who it is. She's not in here, though. You can figure that out. Um, who likes to make mischief. And uh, we were talking tonight at supper. We were talking, um, and she was talking about uh, a way to get at the people behind you in the drive through And she came. I don't know where she comes up with these things, but she was like, here's what you need to do. If there's somebody behind you that you don't like at the drive through just say to the person, I, um, I, I've got their meal, too, Okay. I've got the person behind me's meal, too. And then when you get up to the second counter, because you paid for it, say, oh, I, I paid for both of those meals, and you take them. So when they get up there, there's no food for them. And I was like, who comes up with these things? <laughs> what kind of mind thinks that up? I don't know. Um, but 
If you are the, that kind of person, that kind of trouble is going to find you and follow you around. That's the lesson here. All right, let's review. We're halfway done. Little vices matter. Keep your heart under control. Keep your tongue under control. Don't jump around whenever there's adversity. Life's not fair, okay? Don't go around making trouble or you'll find that trouble eventually. This next one is really a, this is a, I've got this highlighted in um, my, the Bible that I read for devotions. Uh, I need this reminder all the time, okay? Seventh lesson is lead with wisdom, not with volume or brute strength. Lead with wisdom, not with volume or brute strength. Look at uh, verse 10. It says, if the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. I think what Solomon is saying is here is that you, if you have to use lots of strength or lots of force with an axe, you probably need to sharpen it. Brother Ernie could tell you, right? If you got your chainsaw and you're trying to cut down a tree and that chainsaw isn't, isn't doing anything and you have to find yourself having to throw your whole back into it, okay, you probably need to sharpen your chainsaw, right? All right, same thing with an axe. If you're just whacking away and nothing's happening and you're having to just kill yourself to try to chop wood, take some time to sharpen the axe, all right? But Solomon makes it clear he's talking about leadership direction here, wisdom, he says, but wisdom is profitable to direct. So I think the lesson is that if you're having to use a lot of brute force, if you're having to raise your voice and throw your weight around, that probably means you, uh, you're, you're, it's probably a good indication that it's time to sharpen the saw and apply some wisdom. Um, to tell you how this, how I apply this for, verse, okay? Whenever I end up, I'm going to say whenever. There's times where it's totally appropriate to do this. But more often than not, when I find myself yelling at my kids and losing my temper with my kids, okay, when I, when I say a lot of things like, just do it because I said so. I'm sure you all have never said that to any of your children, okay? Um, but when I do that, usually... There's some wisdom that's missing in my life that got us to that point. And I'm not saying that there's not a time to say, hey, I'm the boss and you need to do what I say, okay? Uh, kids are to be under authority and, and listen to their parents and all that, okay? Uh, whether their parents have a good reason or not. But almost always there's a better way to handle it than just yelling and using brute force, force okay? Usually... It got to that point because I wasn't doing something I should have done. And, you know, imagine the church. If I have to get up here, you know, stomp my foot and be like, you need to do it because I'm a pastor and, and just do it. All right. That is, a, that is a symptom of a failure of leadership and a failure of wisdom. Okay. And it probably means, means I need to sharpen the axe. Uh, or I wouldn't need to swing it that hard, okay? So lead with wisdom, not with volume or brute strength. Number eight, keep your mouth under control. I know we're repeating this, but that's the next lesson here again. Okay, look at verse 11 to 15. It says, surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and the babbler is no better. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is mischievous madness. A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be, what shall be after him. Who can tell him? The labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them, because he knoweth not how to go to the city. Okay, think again, Solomon's talking about keeping our tongue under control. Um, the book of James teaches us that our tongue reveals our heart. That if we can control our tongue, we can control our heart, okay? Our tongue's a window to our soul. So if you're wise, you'll be wise with your words. And if you're foolish, you'll drive people crazy with your words. So be careful with your words, okay? Um, it says here, a fool also is full of words. 
It's a good thing to repeat. You know, our, our moms used to say to us, right? Maybe your mom didn't, but we got two ears and one mouth for a reason. So we should listen more than we talk. Um, look at verse 9. Ninth one here, verses 16 and 17. Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child, and thy princes eat in the morning. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. Uh, this is talking about how bad it is for a group when the leader is immature and selfish. You know, think about all of the immature and selfish leaders that Israel had in history. Think about Ahab pitching a hissy fit, right? Because, you know, the Patch the Pirate song. Um, because he couldn't get Naboth's vineyard. All right? Men like Jeroboam, wicked to the core, acted like spoiled brats. Okay? Um, think about kings like Louis XIV, just total spoiled brat kings. Okay? And true leadership is the opposite of that. True leadership is assuming responsibility, putting the needs of those under you above your own. Sacrifice. Think about Christ, right? Christ is the ultimate example of a leader and the ultimate example of love. And how did he show his love? He gave himself for the church. All right? Um, great leaders are, are givers, and they put others above themselves. And unfortunately, we have... Uh, uh, whether it's politicians or whether it's church leaders or what, there's an epidemic of bad leadership. And it hurts the country, it hurts churches, um, it's bad. All right. So mature, selfless leaders, leadership is invaluable. Lesson 10, this is another one that I need to be reminded of often. Laziness destroys houses. Laziness destroys houses. Look at verse 18. It says, By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. Um, how many have ever been in a building that just literally was like dropping through? Maybe an uh, old house or something, you walk in and the floor is just falling apart. Okay, that's the, the picture there. And I think what Solomon is, is getting at here is you go to someone's house and it's just a mess. The house is just falling in on itself. It's not been taken care of. And more often not, than not, the source of that, it, that kind of thing is laziness. Um, how many understand order does not just happen? There's this thing called entropy in our universe. Things tend to disorder naturally. They do not tend to order. Order doesn't just happen. So if you want to make order, if you want to make beauty, you have to work at it, right? Even in the Garden of Eden, the, the garden had to be tended. There was work that had to be done. And um, when you let things go, things will fall apart. They'll fall to disorder and they'll fall to entropy, not to order and beauty. Those things don't happen by accident. So our laziness, when we're lazy and we don't do the things that we're supposed to do, uh, we have messes that build up all around us. And it's, we have nothing to blame besides our own laziness for that, okay? Our slothfulness. So look, if your life is a mess, it might be because of slothfulness and idleness. If your kids are wild and crazy, it might be because... You're being slothful as a parent. You're spending more time on you know, YouTube or watching television or doing your thing than you are parenting. Um, if we want to do something that's beautiful and not decaying, we have to work at it. All right, two more lessons here and we're done. Um, verse 11, uh, actually verse 9, the 11th one, verse 19. Okay, it says, A feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. Now, this one's really hard to interpret, um, but I think what Solomon meant here is that you have to produce to consume. You have to produce to consume. All right, in other words, um, there's nothing wrong with feasting. There's nothing wrong with consumption. 
but consumption costs money, right? Um, you have to be able to pay for it. And if all you do is consume, 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 and you never work, you're headed for ruin. And at some point, you need to make money, and you need to keep the proportion of consumption underneath the proportion of income. I heard a preacher say, that, say this one time. He said, if your outgo exceeds your income, then your upkeep will be your downfall. And I think that was a cute way of saying uh, you need to spend less than you make, and you need to make sure that there's money that's coming in faster than the money is going out. Um, I read a book a couple weeks ago. It was a fascinating book. It was called The Psychology of Money. And it was about, um, really, really interesting. And one of the points it kept making over and over again is that it doesn't really matter in the long run how much money you make. Um, it matters how much money you keep and that you're wise with it over the long term. And it, it told stories of people that were like on the Forbes 100 list that that died with less than nothing. I mean, they just lost it all spectacularly because they spent money like crazy. And it told stories of people that were gas station attendants that died with millions of dollars in the bank and gave it all to their local hospital, okay? And the only difference is one of them learned how to manage their money and was wise with it and plotted it over time and the other people spent $12 for every $10 they make. It doesn't ma matter if you make $200,000 or you make $30,000. What matters is how much in proportion that you make that you're spending. Um, I read something. This made me a little bit angry. Um, something like three quarters of people that make $200,000 or more a year live paycheck to paycheck. Three quarters of people that live 200, make $200,000 or more a year live paycheck to paycheck. You know, I've tried to change my perceptive of this, perception of this. I used to be, when I saw a really nice car, I thought, man, that guy must be rich. He has a really nice car. And now I, th I see it, I'm like, man, that guy makes really bad financial decisions. <laughs> Do you know, that, that, that's, there, are, there are former NBA superstars, one of my, my favorite player when I was in high school, played for the Celtics, Antoine Walker. Um, I think he made $100 million in his career. Uh, he works as a bank teller in Chicago now. He lost everything. Not that there's anything wrong with being a bank teller, but you wouldn't expect someone that once had $100 million to be a bank teller, right? Um, it's all gone. Um, and on the other hand, you got people that are just, you know, regular people, and they, they're wise with their money, and so money answers all. Just be wise with your money, I think, is the, the lesson there. All right, one more thing and we'll be done. Um, number 12, be very careful when you cr complain about leaders. Look at verse 20. It says, curse not the king, no, not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber, for a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. Okay. I think Solomon is saying, just be careful when you criticize authority. Um, they always seem to hear about it. And uh, powerful people can take vengeance. Just be careful about it. Um, it's wise just to be careful what you say about authority figures, uh, whether they be the boss at work or a ruler or a leader. Um, just be wise and careful about what you say because your words can get you in trouble there. All right? So let's go through this list again, and, uh, and we'll take the prayer request, all right? It says, uh, number one, the first, just I'll give you my list I wrote down. Little vices matter. Keep your heart under control. Keep your tongue under control. Don't jump around or jump ship whenever there's adversity. Life isn't going to be fair. Don't go around making trouble, or that trouble will find you. Lead with wisdom, not with volume or brute strength. Keep your mouth under control. Uh, again, mature, selfless leadership is valuable. Laziness destroys houses. You must produce more than you consume. Be very careful when you complain about leaders. And that's our list there. That's 12. Let's all stand together and we'll have a word of prayer. Brother Hedrick, if you want to come and lead us in a song, and then we'll take prayer requests. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. 
the wisdom that's in it, Lord, uh, it's to be a lamp to our feet, a light to our path, and there's things that we can all learn. And Lord, I know that there's things in that list that spoke to me, and Lord, I pray that I'll, I'll work on those things and uh, that you'll help the, the people tonight to work on whatever applied to them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask uh, Kenny if you want to come up and pray over these prayer requests tonight, um, and uh, we'll take go ahead and take some prayer requests. Uh, be in prayer for um, we've got a couple of folks that have COVID right now. Um, the Jenna, I think, is is uh, getting over that. Have you heard anything from her? Okay, okay, she's just finishing up her her that, and then. Uh, Brother Dick and Miss Judy have it. Um, they let me know tonight to ask us if we pray for them. They're back. They were in North Carolina, and they're home now, so if you'll pray for them. Um, so uh, just pray, pray for that. Uh, all right. Anybody else have a prayer request that they'd like to mention tonight? Becky. Becky. Becky Earp has it as well. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Kip, what? Courier. Let's pray for the family of Kip Courier, this young man that committed suicide uh, associated with Jenna's old church there. Um, okay. Anybody else? Prayer request? Do you have a prayer request, Emily? What? Every, help everyone to not get sick. That's a good prayer request. All right. Anybody else? Oh, yes. My my girls won the genetic lottery. I'll tell you that. Uh, they have uh, Audrey has. You know, her eye issue, Noah has this eye issue, and now the girls have some pretty severe scoliosis and have to wear a brace 18 hours a day um, for probably for a couple of years. And Molly is not happy about that, uh, as you can imagine as a, you know, 11-year-old would be. So um, just uh, if you'll pray for them. Um, much worse things could befall you than having to wear a brace, but pray for them. All right, yes. Okay. Okay. Dwight's friend's grandmother has health issues. Do you know her name? No. Okay. <laughs> Dwight's friend's grandma. All right. <laughs> yes.
Okay. So we'll pray for Miss Diepholz's arm. Yes, Miss Betty. Okay. Okay. Um, so, okay. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Bad. Okay. I'm sorry. So pray for Kathy Basham. Um, I didn't know if that was good news or bad news. So, um, got some bad news there. Okay. Yes. What was her name again? Beulah Wells. Beulah Wells. Okay. Pray for Josie's shoulder. Uh, continue to pray for Don Davidson. Do you have any update on him? Okay. 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 Yes, sir. Pray for Patty Webb's mother. All right. Pray for Doris. I'm sure she would be here tonight. She's been really struggling with allergies this year, and they can't figure out what's going on. So um, pray for her. What? And and Miss Cindy, uh, you've noticed she's been uh, missing quite a bit because of her allergy issues and her voice gone. So pray for her. And um, it's just I don't know what's going on there, but. All right, anybody else? Prayer request? Kenny, I tried to make as good notes as I can. Good luck reading my handwriting. No one else can, so don't feel bad if you can't. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for today. Lord, thank you that we get to come worship you in church, Lord. Uh, Lord, we live in a very sinful time, Lord, uh, with everything going on. Lord, we uh, pray that your will will be done in everything that happens and that no matter what happens, Lord, we need to realize that you are the one that authorized this to happen and be okay with it. Lord, uh, we pray for all the sicknesses that are happening. Lord, uh, many people with COVID, uh, Don Davidson, with his or uh, with their health issues, and Patty's mom with uh, Lord, uh, we pray that it won't be cancer, Lord. We pray that, Lord, by the next, I think they said tomorrow is when they're going to be get hearing the results. Lord, we pray that it would just a miraculous, you would do something miraculous here, and that Lord, you are the great physician. You can take away whatever they think or whatever this was what they thought it was and that you can do a work here lord i love you and praise you for all you do in jesus name i pray amen
All right, let's stand together and we'll close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the good service that we had tonight. And I pray that you'll be with the prayer requests, Lord, that were mentioned. Um, there's no way we could answer all of them or so many, but pray that you'd be with those folks that have been struggling with sickness for a while. Lord, we know that Doris and Cindy, and I'm sure there are others, um, just really having a hard time this year with uh, allergies and congestion and losing their voice and not feeling good. And Lord, uh, I don't know what's going on, but we pray that you'll help them. Um, Lord, I pray that you'd be with uh, the folks that are that are um, going through COVID again, and um, Becky and um, the Earps, uh, Dick and Judy. I pray that you'll help them. And um, Lord, we pray that you'd keep that uh, from spreading more than it should, and um, protect our church, Lord, in that way. And Father, Lord, we pray that you'd be with Dwight's friend's grandmother that's going through this hard time. We pray that you'll help her and. Um, Lord, I know there's lots of folks that are traveling. I pray that you'll keep them safe. Um, help our church, Lord, as we go into this summer season. There's a lot to do, and uh, Lord, we pray that you'll just uh, help us to, uh, to take, the, take the burden and to serve you. Be with the folks tomorrow that'll be uh, working on the scriptures. We pray that you'll bless their efforts. And uh, just bless our church, Lord, as we seek to serve you and lift you up. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.